Here we go again. Nice to be with you. It is, of course, ladies and gentlemen, across the universe, time for the James Whale Radio Show. James Whale! So, hello, how are you doing today? Thank you very much indeed for uh, for all the responses over the last couple of shows. Uh, I'm here for the next hour. Guests on the program, well, we've got a Hollywood star and we've got, well, we I'll tell you who we've got in a bit. Uh, but I can say, actually, uh, to uh, David Hove. Hello, David. He texts us. He's James. Could you please try and get uh, either Nick Pope on UFOs or other guests with mysterious subjects because I find them fascinating. Uh, well, listen, David Hove, you stay tuned because we have a medium, uh, one of the uh, new mediums. He refers to himself as the modern medium. We'll be talking to this man, and I'll tell you who it is uh, in a little while. Uh, Robbo, are you awake? I'm awake today. Good man, yes. Well, our producer, of course, Robbo, who puts this uh, extravaganza together. Did I see a tweet of you reading a newspaper, or were you sitting on the toilet? I can't remember. I was looking at the pictures in a newspaper. Yeah, well, I suppose that's a start. Next, you could start reading, couldn't you? Okay. Now, what do we start off doing? Oh, we've got some new radio stations as well, haven't we? Uh, we want to say hi to uh, 107.9 Radio 25 Live, uh, who signed up with us this week. Thank you very much. That's all right. Not you. Why are you thanking me? I'm not thanking you. Who are you thanking? Thanking the people at 107.9 Radio 25 Live. Yeah, I, I wonder if I suggest to them that 107.9 Radio 25 Live, it's quite a, a, quite a long title, isn't it? We'll just call them Radio 25 from now on then. Shall we? Yeah. But anyway, very nice to have you with us. As it is about, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 other radio stations, if you would like to have the James Whale Show... Uh, on your station, just get in touch with Robbo here. Uh, you can get in touch with him by emailing jameswellradio at gmail.com. And uh, who knows? Uh, and we, we are worldwide, Robbo, now, aren't we? We are officially global. A station in Cyprus has just taken us. What do you mean? Don't you know the name of the radio station in Cyprus? I do. I was just seeing if you knew the name of the radio station. Cyprus. Cyprus. Is that you're auditioning for the Eurovision Talentless yes. Contest? Yeah, yeah. Non, n- nil point. Cyprus do quite well, don't they, actually? Yeah. So hi to all those on uh, Cyprus who are listening via... Napa Radio. Yeah. Because Aya Napa is the place that all the young uh, people like myself go to uh, to party. Do you? Yeah. I don't know what you're laughing at. Uh, so anyway, if you want to get in st- uh, touch, you've got a radio station, would like to take the show, please, uh, please do. Uh, now, talentgb.com, uh, they put this show out. So do Audio Boo and our thanks to them. Plus, of course, you can get it on our website at jameswellradio.co.uk. And to get in touch with us, this is a way, and this helps fund the program as well. Text me any time. Uh, during or after you've heard the show, if there's anything we're talking about on the program you would like to uh, respond to or you've got a thought about things like David Howe that you would like to hear us talk about on the show, uh, text me. Text 81888, 81888, text whale, then your message, and send it to 81888. Calls cost 25p plus standard rates, and uh, that helps fund the program. Now, I've got a topic. I, I, a lot of you have responded to some of the topics we put out last week and some of the topics, of course, uh, on Facebook and Twitter uh, that we mention during the week in between the programs. But you may remember we talked last week about Denmark actually uh, banning the uh, religious slaughter of animals and halal and kosher meat was now going to be outlawed in Denmark. Do you remember that, Rob? I do. We had an awful lot of response to that, you may remember. Yeah, we did. Well, uh, you might like to know now that this week, uh, religious customs associated with slaughtering animals should be adapted to take in more humane methods of killing. This is according to the leader of Britain's vets, right? Uh, So this is quite an important guy, and this is causing quite a stir in the religious communities at the moment, because John Blackwell, president-elect of the British Veterinary Association, has said 
that religious slaughter of poultry, sheep, and cattle causes unnecessary suffering to animals. Uh, traditionally, of course, Jewish and Islamic slaughterers practice uh, this um, uh, slitting of the throat without any uh, any stunning at all. Mr. Blackwell suggests stunning the animals so that they are unconscious before the fatal cut is made uh, would be wise. Uh, there is some other upsetting information coming about the slaughter of animals. Quite often, uh, around about 10%, I think, of animals that are slaughtered uh, are stunned badly. Uh, and that has to be avoided as well. Uh, Mr. Blackwell said that the way halal and kosher meat is created through the throat being slit resulted in five or six seconds of pain for the animal. And if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, that's quite a lot of time for pain. Uh, they will feel the massive injury of the tissues of the neck they will perceive the aspiration of blood they will breathe in before they lose consciousness and so the uh, president elect of the british veterinary association john blackwell says he would like to see uh, ritual slaughter stopped or modified in this country so if you have a thought on that uh, text us 81888 uh, starting your text with the word whale, and send me your thoughts on that, because now it looks as if we may follow Denmark in uh, the stopping of uh, ritual slaughter of animals. But I think the slaughter of animals needs to be addressed as well. I eat meat, by the way. I'm not a vegetarian, but I think we have to actually uh, try harder in the way we slaughter such meat. Maybe meat needs to be more expensive. Maybe we all need to eat a little bit less meat, because the amount of meat that we slaughter in this country... And the amount of meat we throw away and we disregard because it's relatively become a lot cheaper than it used to be. Maybe we need to address these thoughts. Rob, have I lost you? No, I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm this news to me. It was quite, quite a serious point, I thought. I think it's a, a natural progression in, in slaughter if they could uh, stun first, then do their ritual. Yeah. Yeah. So, text me your thoughts, 81888, text whale, plus, of course, uh, your message, put whale, don't just send whale, we can just send whale in, but put your message about that, and anything else we're talking about, uh, and send it to me, as I say, calls cost 25p, plus standard rates. Um, some of the things we talked about last week, and uh, uh, that you've responded to, uh, are quite interesting, and I've got some here on uh, on war, that would be a good good place to play Edwin Starr, wouldn't it? Have we got Edwin Starr? Um, no, because we don't have much in the way of music because we've only got an hour and we want to get stuff in. Uh, so I asked this question. I think this was on Facebook. Uh, as we are about to commemorate 100 years since the Great War, uh, it looks like we could be involved in another one, this time in the Ukraine. And uh, my thought is, haven't we learned a damn thing? Have we not learned anything I mean, look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq. Are we any better off and any safer because of that? No, I don't think we are. I don't think we are. And and commemorating, not celebrating, as some people have said, commemorating a uh, hundred years since the outbreak of the First World War, one of the bloodiest incidents in European history. And people look back at it, and, and why? Because two blokes started arguing. Not Not because Germany... And, and Britain and then dragging in Brussels and France and everything else. Two blokes, like, like this is what happens all the time. Two people start uh, uh, arguing. Putin and now Obama having a go at each other. And I see that uh, Hillary Clinton recently has, uh, has joined the uh, fray and said that she thinks Putin is behaving like Adolf Hitler. Is this really going to help the course of man? Well, I don't think it is. Uh, Kevlar Taxi. Hi, Kev. Listens in uh, in Cardiff as he uh, wanders around in his taxi. We haven't man mentioned him for a few uh, a, f a few programmes, have we? Well, we could say Kevlar Taxi a few times. Well, okay. once is enough. Okay. Well, OK, Kevlar Taxi, that's four times. Uh, Kev says, you've only got to read the story of Easter Island to show what a bunch of Muppets humans really are. Is war any surprise? Nope, I'm not surprised, which is... A shame, really. Um, Jeff Hobbs makes a really good point. He says, if all wars stopped, 
the big arms companies would go bust overnight. As long as there are people making weapons and politicians eager to send someone else's son or daughter, husband, etc., into battle, we will have wars. However, if the people revolted and the troops all said no collectively and the politicians and owners of the arms companies had to go and fight themselves instead, there would be no wars. Got a point, hasn't he, really? Uh, Christine Cameron, no relation, said, we shouldn't need to get involved in every conflict around the world. We've got our own issues in Britain to deal with. And Diane Hammond says it's inevitable that eventually we'll get sucked into a third man's war. Man is his own worst enemy. And she's probably right. If women were, well, mind you, there were some pretty feisty women fighters Fred Walton says, I wouldn't say we are doomed, but as long as there is mankind, there will be greed. As long as there is greed, there will be war. So we just have to live with it, which is a rather cheery thought, is it not? Uh, You're listening to the James Whale Radio Show online, on air, on everything. Yeah, on everything. Mm. I don't like to say we're just on, because we're on air, obviously, uh, maybe on the radio station that you're listening to at the moment. Uh, We are, of course, broadcasting online everywhere. Uh, So we're around the universe as well as the world. And uh, you can get us at uh, talentgb.com, audio boo. I think we're out on YouTube as well, aren't we? We are. And if you want to get in touch, text 81888. Text the word whale plus your message to me. And uh, tell me your thoughts on some of the things we've been talking about. Now. Uh, first guest on the program today. Sometimes we have one guest, sometimes we have two, sometimes we have none. Uh, David Hove uh, texted me and he said he'd like to have some of the uh, more unusual, mysterious guests on. And if you agree with that, text me and tell me any suggestions. I will try and get Nick Pope on the program, I promise. Um, but listen, I'm, I'm now going to have a chat. Uh, to a man whose name is Ryan Gooding. Now, Ryan Gooding is uh, is a modern medium. Uh, in my long career, I've talked to loads of mediums, and I have never yet managed to get a message from the other side. Could today's show buck the trend? You are listening to James and Rob on the James Well. Uh, joining me now is Ryan Gooding, the modern medium. Is that right, Ryan? Hello. Yes, it is. Hi, James. How are you? I'm very good, Ryan. Now, you're a, you're appearing at the very well-known Sugar Hut, uh, home yes. of Towie, in the not-too-distant future. Is that right? Yes, that's coming up next week. So that's coming up Tuesday the 11th of March. Now, you're, you're a medium, uh, a, a psychic, is that right? Or a, a, are you a medium as well? Um, I'm a psychic medium. So that basically means psychic as well as doing mediumship. All right. Now, if I say Doris Stokes to you, uh, you will know exactly who I'm talking about then. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Because uh, Doris Stokes, probably one of the most famous mediums ever, uh, that I, I did a number of interviews with back in the 80s. Uh, she was an amazing lady. Uh, are you a similar sort of medium? Yeah, very similar. Very similar to her kind of um, picking up on spiritual energies around people, but also giving like, guidance and maybe predictions for the future. So, yeah, very, mm. very, very similar. Yeah. How does this work, Ryan, in, in somewhere like, like the Sugar Hut, which is a bar, it's loud, there's lots of flashing lights and things. How, how do you manage to contact the other side in a place like that? So, the, I mean, the evening, obviously, normally, there's a lot of music, a lot of people dancing around. But um, on this particular evening, it's, it's, it's a sit-down audience. Um, so there's no kind of music. There's no kind of uh, flashing lights or anything like that. Um, and it is basically going to individuals in the audience um, and passing on messages from the other side. So um, it, is, it is a quiet atmosphere, which it needs to be, um, because it was noisy. And obviously, to do this sort of thing, you have to concentrate, you have to focus. Um, so if we were, you know, in the middle of the dance floor, then that wouldn't really, <laughs> wouldn't really work. <laughs> do you do you ever have uh, have problems with with contact? In the sense of contacting somebody. 
Yeah, yeah. When you're in the middle of a show like that, what, what happens if there's absolutely nothing coming through? To be honest, up until this point, that's never happened. So I'm, I'm not sure. I think running away is the answer. Um, however, there have been, you know, um, I, I would say out of the hundreds of people I've seen, three or four individuals that have come for like a more intimate one-to-one reading um, and just nothing, nothing comes through. Nobody's there to talk to. They're not telling me anything. And you just have to kind of be honest. You just have to kind of say nobody's here. Um, but in, in terms of normally, I think when you've got about 200 people in front of you, you know, sometimes more, you normally that somebody is coming through, somebody is coming through. Um, and you do, you do have nights that you think have gone better than others. Um, and some of the shows just depending on what kind of thing comes through. And although you're talking to one person, you've still got the other hundreds to entertain. So if what is coming through is quite interesting, then it makes the evening very entertaining, you know. Um, if it's not as interesting, then the other people can lose interest. So you do have some nights that you feel are going better than others. When did you first know that you had this gift? Because it, it, it is a gift, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I would say it is a gift. I would say it is. I would say, you know, I was very lucky um, to be born into a family that spoke about it a lot um, and, and witnessed things themselves. Um, there's generations of travellers in my mum's side of the family um, and it was from about the age of four that they tell me that that was when they kind of really knew I was saying things and talking about things that I shouldn't have known about or you know wouldn't have known so from a very young age um, and I was very lucky to have a family that supported what I was doing you know um, and kind of you know said if that's what you're doing and that's what you want to do off you go do it and they were very supportive so I was quite lucky um, if I'd have been born into a family, say a Catholic family, and started talking about this sort of stuff, um, a lot of Catholics think it's the work of the devil, so I probably wouldn't be where I am now. Did it frighten you when you were younger? No, not really. It's not. It's, a lot of people think, you know, um, they imagine seeing, you know, mediums seeing people walking around and things like that, and it's not always like that, and it's, it's very comforting, very comforting. Um, and... Not really. I can't say a time where it, it's, it's frightened me. It might have frightened others, um, but it's never really, never really scared me or made me feel uneasy. Well, I remember in- interviewing Doris Stokes one time, and she suddenly, she suddenly stiffened and suddenly turned to someone who was in the production team uh, of the programme that I was doing and took them aside took them out of the place and, and had a long chat with them about something. And this person came back uh, and they said, I, I, I was very sceptical. I didn't believe a word of it. I thought it was all tosh. Uh, they've just told me something about my grandfather who died a, a, a year or so ago that they couldn't possibly have known. Does that ever happen to you? Do you ever get that sort of thing? You're, you're talking to somebody and then something else happens? Yeah, it, yeah, it can do. Um, I remember before before working as a full time medium, I worked in an opticians, and as this lady, she just picked up her new glasses. Completely different thing we were talking about. And as she got up and walked out, I could just see this little girl walking behind her. So I just quickly ran over to her and I said, "I have to tell you, there, there's a little girl behind you, and she's telling me that you're her mum." And she was absolutely blown away, absolutely blown away. Um, and then from that, she actually came back and met me in a better environment and she had, you know, a personal reading. Um, so you can, you know, you can be out and about, you can be walking around the supermarket and all of a sudden something pops into your mind or you see something around somebody. Um, but, you know, you have to be careful, obviously, how you approach it. Some people don't want to know these things. Some people do. Um, so, yeah, it, it can happen quite often. It can happen quite often. What, what in your mind, when you're, you're thinking about these things yourself, what, what, where do you think this, the spirit world is? I mean, where does, does everybody go? Do animals go there? We, um, well, myself, um, I'm known as the modern medium because of my modern approach and my modern belief in the spirit world. The spirit world is, is not kind of, there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no good, there's no bad. Everybody goes to the same place. Um, and it is just basically on a different energy level. And, you know, I never forget talking to animals. I never forget speaking to a lady in a region. And her mum and dad were talking to her, firing away at her, all this information. And she was absolutely fine. The minute I mentioned her horse that she had lost a few weeks prior to the reading, 
she was absolutely emotional wreck, you know? And, mm. um, yeah, so, you know, animals can sometimes mean more to people than, than, than human beings. And, um, yeah, so it can be quite interesting what comes through. But I would say everybody goes to the same place. You know, I never forget an incident. There was a local um, guy, and he, he, he murdered a lady, and then he committed suicide. And I saw a member of the family and um, for a reason, and as much as her relative come through that was murdered, so did the guy that, had, you know, took her life. Um, and that, that's quite normal. It, you know, it's quite normal for spirit to... They kind of forgive and forget everything when we get to the other side. So it doesn't matter what we do here, whether it's good or bad. We do go to the same place. It must be quite congested over there if everybody from every time is there. Or do you go and exist in the time that is relevant to you? I mean, am, am I going to go over there and bump into Attila the Hun or Adolf Hitler or Winston Churchill? Or will I bump into the <laughs> people know, that I know. lived with? Um, but I, I, it, is, it is very much in the sense of, um, obviously here we're physical beings, so we, we take up space. We need space to live in. We need space to do different things in. Spirit don't have any physical. There's nothing physical there. It's an energy. So there there is no need for houses. There's no need for pubs and supermarkets and hospitals and all things like that. They are just an energy. So they don't, they don't need as much room. Um, but they are also on different levels. They can be on different energy levels um, or energy planes um so you know you you could be on the same with as adolf hitler you may be on a different one um but you always tend to stick with two or three people from your physical life um and some people say to me will that be my husband will that be my mom will that be my brother and it doesn't necessarily mean it will be it could be somebody that you just knew for two years of your physical life um that you do huddle with with people um that you didn't know how uh, I, I've asked a number of mediums over the years that I've interviewed. I've never, ever had any of my relatives come back to me. Why have they never come back to see me? Why have they never made a point of uh, of getting in touch? Do you mean you personally seeing them or do you mean through a medium? Yeah. through a medium. I, I've interviewed many, many mediums, and but I've never had one. So nobody's ever said to you, James, this is propped up, or James, I can see this. And they've not done that? No. That surprises me. That surprises me. That surprises me. Um, but then I always say to people that, you know, I, I can only talk about my work and I can only, you know, describe how it works for me. It is a very supernatural thing. Um, and I, I know that, you know, when, when I'm on the phone to somebody or somebody from a distance away from me, it doesn't always happen, all right? Um, but I'm pretty sure if I was sitting next to you right now, I would probably be picking things up. What happens if somebody in the spirit world wants to get in touch with someone they used to know? I mean, do they, do they think like that? Is there, is there a, do, do sometimes they want to? And if you never go to see a medium, how do they get in touch with you? They They... They, what I call hover, they hover around people um, and they may put certain thoughts into your head, they may influence you and your gut instinct, your intuition, those sort of things they influence, um, but it is, you know, they don't get frustrated by the fact they can't talk to you because they know the reason why they can't, so they understand that. Um, but there are, you know, there are, there are cases where spirits are making themselves known to myself and I haven't got a clue who they're trying to talk to and that person's not necessarily around me you know they could be anywhere in the world sometimes um so it, it can be it can be frustrating for people to not know and obviously going to a medium is the, is the best way to find out if there is anybody trying to contact you is there something specific that they want to say um however I always say to people when you go to see mediums you have to separate those that are of, uh, if you like, fake or fraud to those that, that are genuine. Um, and because that's quite a big controversial, like controversial subject. What happens when somebody try, thinks that you're a fraud, they don't believe in any of this sort of thing, they say you're talking nonsense, uh, and some people, of course, as you know, Ryan, get very upset about this sort of thing as well. How do you deal with that? I always say to people, I always say, if if you come to see me, um, you know, you come and sit and you have a one-to-one -one reading and you still think it's nonsense, then that, that, that is fair play. 
Um, I'm very strict when people walk in. And the first thing that they're told is they simply can only say yes or no. They can't answer my questions. They can't, you know, I don't want to hear any life history or details. I just want yes or no um, to try and prevent the whole he was reading that off me or I told him something that led him to that, um, to stop all of that. Um, but everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And I always, always say that if I didn't have this gift, I would be one of those people that didn't believe because of the way my mind worked. You know, I go out to paranormal investigations or houses where people have phoned up because they're convinced that there's spirit in their house and their house is haunted. And I could walk in there easily and say, yes, it is, you know, and these people would believe that. But to me, it's not about doing that. It is about being honest and upfront. And I would, I, you know, on a paranormal investigation, you know, you know how it is. Oh, somebody banged on the door. Did everybody hear that? Now, I want to know every single possible reason why that wasn't spirit. You know, I want every single reason to be eliminated because there are too many people out there that will take a picture of a little blur on the corner. And they say, can you see that light? No, that's not a light. That's a hair or that's your finger over the camera lens or, you know, so I'm very, I am very skeptic when it comes to those sorts of things. So I, I completely understand why people maybe don't believe in it. Um, you know, and, not, and I'm one of those people where I've got my belief, somebody else has theirs. And if we don't agree, we just agree to disagree. We, but, but there's no need to fall out about it or, you know, become nasty about it. And it, it does upset people. It does upset some people. Um, some people don't like the thought that you, you're passing on misinformation to people. And if it wasn't true... That would upset a lot of people. That there are people out there believing that they're talking to their loved ones if they weren't, um, and I completely get that as well. But to be honest with you, I think a lot of the time when people are are sceptic, intrigued, or disbelievers, I've never had anybody be rude about it. Nobody's ever been rude, and you know, and I've never been rude to anybody else. If they turn around and say to me, "I don't believe this, Ram. This is not my thing," that's fine. That's that's absolutely fine. You know, we're all entitled to our own beliefs and opinions. So you're at the Sugar Hut in Brentwood, right in the heart of Towie Land. Uh, what's the date? It's the 11th of March. That's uh, the 11th of March, and uh, you better get there early, otherwise you won't get in. Uh, just before we finish, Ryan, uh, Rob, my producer, and I here, can, can you see anything, hear anything around us? No, I cannot. No, I can't. No, I can't. But I would love to pop in and... Um maybe see what we could do on, on, on a show um, and see what we could pick up. That would be quite interesting. In the future. In the meantime, Ryan yeah, Gooding, the modern you. medium, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Take care. Uh, so there we are. That's Ryan Gooding. Robbo, did you enjoy that? That was excellent. Didn't find anything for you or me, though. This is, I've over the years, I've talked to loads of mediums. I mean, Derek Cora was a regular on my show. Doris Stokes and others who were... And I never get messages. It's probably Skype, you know, because we do these calls over Skype, and I think the dead people probably didn't have Skype when they were around, so they don't know how to get in. No, they're not. No, no, no. They're not dead. It's a spit. It's it. it, It's an energy force. You're not dead. You never die. Oh, okay. I mean, obviously. Listen, if I wasn't doing the breakfast show on BBC Essex, I'd be at the Sugar Hut. Because you know, when when you're a Jedi, you can come back from the dead. Can you? Yeah, Master Yoda and yeah. uh, Ben Kenobi, they came right. back. Um, that's how I want to come back, I think, because I'm, I'm practicing to be a Jedi, so I think I'll yeah. come back like that. You're completely nuts, aren't you? I mean, let's be honest. You make sensible, serious people like Ryan Gooding and me sound even more sensible and serious. You're studying to be a Jedi. I, I am. Oh, God. Do you know, lots of people get upset when you, when you interview uh, mediums. I want, if anybody is upset, then uh, text us on our special text number, which is, remind me... 81888. Starting your message with the word whale. Include your name if you want a shout-out on the show. Text costs 25p plus standard network rate. 81888. If you are a fan of mediums, if you believe in mediums, or if you don't, tell me why you don't. Maybe you think it's a bad idea. Some people get very upset about that sort of thing. In fact, uh, lots and lots of radio stations wouldn't allow me to do an interview with a medium. Why? I don't. Well, I don't understand. You know, people people have to have a certain amount of time uh, allotted, or they used to, and they'll 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 have um, 
so-called religion, you know, so they'll have uh, Muslims, Christians, they'll, they'll be allotted times, but you can't talk to mediums. Uh, perhaps somebody will, will tell me what the difference is. I mean, these are all people with a faith. Well, like you, you believe you're a Jedi. So people are entitled to their own belief. Uh, and uh, some people seem to think that their beliefs are more important than others. In the words of one of my favourite uh, interviewees, Boy George, who was uh, here with us, what programme was that? People, if they miss that programme, they can go to the website and listen again, by the way. Oh, uh, 19, episode 19. Uh, and George, of course, his song, My God is Bigger Than Your God. You know, let's live and let live a little. Anyway, Ryan Gooding there. And... <laughs> Um, the modern medium. I bet he'd be really entertaining doing... I'd like to go and see one of his shows. We should go one night. Sure. Could we arrange to do a live kind of web chat, audio sort of thingy, get Ryan in and invite people to call us and um, uh, see if he can do readings on the programme or not? I can't see why we couldn't have a go. Well, I'll tell you what, if you'd be interested in uh, in, in doing a special... Uh, with Ryan Gooding on the programme, text me 81888, start your text with the word whale, and uh, and let me know your thoughts. Some people are a bit scared of it. Would you like to hear me talk to more mediums on the show? Uh, we're going to do some uh, some spooky stuff. We're going to do some people in the future who've spoken to aliens. I kid you not. I kid you not. But as I said, if you have a suggestion, uh, text me 81888, start your text with the word whale. Message costs 25p plus standard rates. Uh, now, um, we've got a lot of people saying they're reading my book. They're not reading my book. They're listening to my book. Is that right? Uh, that's right, yeah. Uh, if you go to our website, if you're not listening via the website, go and click on the website. Uh, the address, Robbo, is jameswellradio.co.uk. And at the top, you see a couple of adverts. One is for um, Love Film, uh, which you can click on. You can get a month's free movies there, by the way, and I'll tell you more about that later. But you can click on Audible. It's difficult to say that, isn't it? Audible. Audible. If you click on the Audible link and register, and if you, I think if you're, if you're already registered with Amazon, you don't even need to register, do you? No, it just uh, says, would you like to join the two accounts together? Yeah. So, yeah, so done. do that, and then you get a free audio book. And, of course, that means you can get my book, Almost a Celebrity, which I read myself, by the way, took forever to do it. You get it free. So I'm giving you free stuff. So uh, go and register with Audible. Get a free – you don't have to have my book. I just thought you might like to. You can have any book you want free because it's like a book club. The first book you get is free. And even if you don't want any more, you can keep that audible book forever and ever and ever and cost you nothing. Now, I think it's probably time for us to play uh, one of the very few pieces of music we have on this show. And if you'd like to have music uh, on the show, if you're in a band and you would like us to play uh, perhaps a uh, uh, something from your band and then get in touch can't promise we'll play it but uh, we could well do and Majestic got in touch and I like a bit of reggae you're going to love this uh, if you want to hear some more of them after this uh, Majestic Live one word MajesticLive.co.uk let's spread the love let's spread some sunshine reggae from Majestic and it's all about love Some people get plenty of love them get. Some get no love in the road. Whoa, no. My eyes have seen this. My heart feels this. My mind won't believe this at all. It's all about love, love, love. 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 All about love, love, love. Love is the key for changes, rearranges structures. 
with wisdom as our guide. Whoa, why? So open your hearts to let love come in. Then allow love to begin, begin. Love makes this world a better place. Whoa, yes. No matter your class, creed, or race, it's all about love, love, love. 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 It's all. We want everybody to live joyful and happy Even though things just we get funny No negative vibes, I am a nag up any Me a beg you stand up firmly No make nobody get your cross and angry Me a go beg you just cool and hairy Just remember jail house never empty It's all about love, love, love It's all about love, love Love, it's all about love, 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 love. Some people get plenty of love and get. Some get no loving at all, oh no. My eyes have seen this, my heart feels this, my mind won't believe this at all. Cause it's all about love, 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 it's all about love, love, love. It's all about love, 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 it's all about love, love, love. 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 Love is the key for changes, rearranges structures with wisdom as a guide. Whoa, whoa. So open your hearts to let love come in Then allow love to begin, begin Love makes this world a better place, oh yes No matter your class, creed or race It's all about love, love, love It's all about love, love Love. It's all about love, love, 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 love. Uh, there we are. I thought that was great. Majestic, uh, la- majestic, the majestic, majesticlive.co.uk if you want to hear more reggae from them there. And it's all about love. If you're a reggae band, get in touch. We'll have to get them back. I'd like to hear more from them. Uh, now, I also asked on, uh, I think this was Facebook and Twitter. I, I put out a couple of things earlier on in the week uh, saying what can be done to reverse the decline in school discipline. We've had lots of stories uh, over the last few days about teachers trying to discipline children. One teacher, quite rightly in my view, by the way, uh, got into trouble for sellotaping shut the mouths of her class of 10 to 11-year-olds. You what? I don't know about you. Yeah, no. She said they were talking too much. I wish you'd read the newspapers. Sorry. Or at least listen to my breakfast radio show on BBC Essex. Well, it's too early in the morning for me. Have you not heard of the iPlayer? I have listened to a few of your shows on iPlayer. Well, you see, if you listen to them all, right, when you get up, put it on your... your, your, your can't you download it to your personal what's-it and stick it in your thingy? 
um, yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a story we covered the other day. Uh, it, it's, it, this woman was upset with these kids talking all the time, so she sellotaped all their mouths. Now, you can imagine how upset the parents were. This woman, by the way, has been suspended. I'm not surprised. And I think Thursday of uh, this week, front page of The Sun with this little lad who uh, had had a sign hung round his neck saying, I want to go to the toilet. Uh, because the head teacher of this particular school, I think it's in Devon, uh, had said there was too much mess being made in the boys' toilets. So if they wanted to go to the toilet, they had to put their hand up. They then had to have a sign put round their neck so that everybody knew it was them that was going to the toilet. So they wouldn't dare leave it in a messy state. Right. Um, so thus ridiculing the child, which is probably not going to help as far as discipline is concerned. And the other thing that this particular school has now said, and I'd like to hear uh, anybody's thoughts on this, uh, text me on this. What do you think about this? The school has now said to parents that you cannot come to sports days, school fates, or presumably into the school until you have been CRB checked. What, the parents? Yep. Wow. You're a parent. Yeah. Of a small child. Mm Mm-hmm. How would you feel if the school your child went to said, I'm sorry, you can't come to the school until we've been sure that you've been CRB checked? That's ridiculous. I would take my child out of that school. Really? I would. Well, that's uh, that's what's happening. What what, what would you do? Text me, uh, 8188, put the word whale first and uh, send me your thoughts on that. We talked about discipline. And here are a couple of your thoughts. Mark Langton uh, Facebooked me. He said, it would help if we were allowed to discipline the kids. It did me no harm. And it did my kids no harm. Just don't go over the top. And I think, Mark, you got it absolutely right. Uh, Jim Burns said, effective teachers who are taught management of pupils, managing disruptive children is key. And it's another good point. Uh, Mark O'Neill says, parents should allow the teachers to discipline their children if they misbehave in school. Anyone who thinks otherwise are the problem, not the solution. Um, How would you feel, Mark, if a teacher stuck your child's mouth together with sellotape? How would you feel, Mark, if the school said you had to be CRB checked before you were allowed to go to the school to to see the teachers or to talk or to go to a school open day or to a sports day? Uh, And John Butler says the parents are partly to blame. If the parents teach their kids how to respect people, then the teachers would get respected. Your thoughts on that? Text me, 8188. Start your text message with the word whale. And uh, calls cost 25p plus your standard rates. Uh, Now, time to talk to my next guest. And just before I introduce him to you, remember, of course, you can get a month's free movies. Go to the website, jameswhaleradio.co.uk. Click on the Love Film banner, and you can get a month of movies free. Now, I tell you that because my next guest uh, is a bloke who's made more films than uh, many, many people. Lots and lots of movies, and I I imagine you can get a lot of them on Love Film. Uh, he's, uh, he's a pretty hard man uh, in movies. He's uh, the, I suppose he, he could, actually. I should ask him. He could have been James Bond. Let's talk to the one and only Craig Fairbrass. Craig, so hard man... Uh, is what you're described as. Every time I spoke to you or speak to you, you you are playing the part of a pretty tough character. Have you always done that? Yes, I'm afraid. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. It's, I've just when I started being an actor, I somehow got um, sort of aimed at those roles and was lucky enough to land them and do them. And obviously, I might obviously doing them okay because they. They keep offering me these parts, so um, I'm more than happy to just keep doing them because, as they as they say, as an actor, you know, you don't worry about being typecast; you worry about being not cast. So, uh, um, yeah. you know, I'm more than happy. Was it um, w- was it a, a real difficult decision for you to leave EastEnders? Because that, I mean, that was regular employment, wasn't it? Yeah, Jesus, that was a long time ago. God, you brought that back. Um, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, but like, funny enough, I left to do the film The Governor, the Lenny McLean story, and it never happened. And oh, then dear. I went back again, and then I left again, and it was all a bit weird. But um, they were gracious enough, you know, at the end of it, we decided I'd, I'd be in Spain, and it's a type of character that could come back at any time. You know, 
the show was very good for me, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful, put it that way. And, I, you know, it's doing really well now, so I'm glad for that. Let's go back even further. How did, how did you first decide you wanted to be an actor, Craig? I always wanted to be an actor. I was watching lots of films with my dad when I was a kid, and um, growing up with Lee Marvin, Charles Bronson, Eastwood, John Wayne, all of those characters, the Bond films, the Connery films. I don't know. I sort of fell in love with movies as a child. And um, just thought about becoming an actor. And I had some problems at the school I was at um, growing up. And I was asked to leave nicely <laughs> because I was one of them sort of kids who couldn't concentrate unless he was doing something he really enjoyed and was interested in. And drama was like an outlet for me. Um, yeah, and it sort of it, it grew from there. And then when I left school, you know, I did the normal, you know, the building sites, working on doors, nightclubs. Um but always had this burning ambition to become an actor. And very quickly, I nip it in the bud. I was about uh -huh. 22, um, and I went up for an audition for a film called For Queen and Country. They'd been looking for an actor to play this young, aggressive, racist cop in London. And um, they, they couldn't find anybody, and I went in at last moment, uh, and I got the role. And it was, lo and behold, it was opposite Denzel Washington. It was the film he come over to do for Queen and Country. And that just started it. That was know. a brilliant break, wasn't it? An amazing break. And I've been lucky, you know, my wife texted me the other night. I was coming home in the car and she said, you know something, this is your 40th movie. Uh, and I was like, really? I knew I'd done a few, but it's when you start looking at it, you know, in, from that perspective, you think everything I set out to do as an actor... I just wanted to work in independent films, um, and I've been lucky enough to do that, and I'm, I'm still doing it, you know. Do you know what I like about characters like you, Craig Best, is you're not a lovey. You're not going to tell me, oh, I, my craft is so important that I, I really want to get <laughs> back on the stage. Like, <laughs> sometimes it gets me in trouble, but I'm just, I try to be as real and as nice as possible and to treat it as a business and to be lucky enough to be in that business and earning a, nicking a few quid and doing what I love. You know, I'm standing on a film the other day. My son is producing it, Luke Fairbrass. He left university, he got his degree. And me, being a type of guy I was, dragged him around film sets. He started working and then he got the bug. Um, and we stood there today, uh, stood there the other day, and we give each other a cuddle and a kiss and just said, you know, we're, we're very lucky to be doing what we're doing. We love doing what we're doing. You know, even though it's on a small scale, we just love it. Well, you've been in some pretty big movies, Craig, as well, it's fair to say, isn't it? I've been in a mix. Yeah, I've, I've been in, in, in a mix of films. To be honest with you, I could, I could, I'd love to nick another big Hollywood one, but you never know. You never know what's around the corner, but yeah, different, different level of films. All Have you never same, been or thought of going to Hollywood? Uh, January is the time when they do, I think, all the pilots out there. Have you never fancied going over there and spending a couple of months seeing what you could do? Well, I have a, we have a place there. You know, I spend as much time as I can there, but I would never do pilot season. I'm not really interested in that. I've got to be honest with you. You know, I went there for one reason and one reason only at the age of 29, and that was to play the lead in an action movie. I was obsessed with it. And um, I was lucky enough to get a role in Cliffhanger. I went back, you know, I've always worked there. And then last year I went to New Orleans and I shot The Outsider, which is me in the lead in an action movie with Jason Patrick, James Kahn, Shannon Elizabeth. Um, it's an OK film. It's not a big Hollywood blockbuster, but it's, it's, a, it's a, an entertaining little film for the amount of time and the money it was shot in. But it was a dream come true for me. Do you know, I, 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 something that opened my eyes, I, I, I have a friend, a guy called Luke Goss. I don't know if you remember, Bross. You probably yes. do. Yeah, yeah, I do. And Luke, Luke moved out to Hollywood a few years ago just because he wanted to be an actor and nobody took That's him right. seriously. It's, a, it's this lovey thing. You know, if you're not part of that lovey scene, people don't take you seriously as an actor in many cases. He makes loads of films. They make lots of films we never even see over here. No, well, there's a huge business out there, you know, for Netflix, home, home entertainment. It's massive. Um, you know, and you've got to remember something, that is the epicenter of the entertainment industry at all levels. So there's guys out there like Luke, some other fellas who are doing it, and they're making like, they're shooting like 20 movies a year, you know, and they'll pop up at four in the morning when you're laying in an hotel room with an hangover. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they're those. But, <laughs> um, but they still work, and... I know he enjoys doing what he does. He's carving a career out as a, as a, you know, as an action guy. I've always found him a, 
quite an odd one because he's quite effeminate to look at. He's not a lump. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, I just, I like those guys who you look at them and you think, yeah, he looks a bit handy. Like the Stathams and that. They're believable. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, I have to tell you, listen, Luke spends most of his off time working out. So when he was in Blade opposite yeah. uh, Wesley Snipes, they had a, a couple of scenes. I think Luke broke Wesley's ankle and that put the movie on hold for about two months. Oh, really? Yeah. I can imagine. Yes. Was, that, <clears throat> was that him slapping him? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, Luke, I don't know about you, but Luke Luke is uh, very keen to do his own stunts. People don't really like that. Right, yeah. Right. Voice insurance in it and all them pubs, things, you know, you get a little bit of feedback, things like that. But the film I'm working on at the moment is going to be a cracker. Um, James Cosmo, Olivia Grant, Emmett Scanlon, Bruce Payne. Um, really, really strong cast. Myself in the lead. It's a really dark vicious London thriller about a secret group of ex-military hitmen who run this secret organisation and I have a, a sort of setback because the people that I've killed are coming back in my mind and affecting me and I mess up and they come after me and my family and they're headed by the, the superb and the one and only man with presence, James Cosmo. Um, Game so of Thrones. A breakdown. It'll be out next year. So we're just finishing on that now. Um, when uh, when when you say it comes out next year, will this be a, a cinema release? Or, <laughs> like, a lot of a lot of good movies go straight to DVD. It, yeah, but it's, it's very different in the UK. If you look at the last couple of films I, I've been in, like Rise of the Foot Soldier, humongous hit, a real massive big cult hit. You know, it was on Sky, it was at the cinema. It's done over a million DVDs. It's still a cult hit now. St George's Day that went to the that was at the cinema. That's on Sky. Sky bought that. You know, these London thrillers, if they're done well, um, which I'm now a big part of, people love. There's a massive audience for them. Um, and breakdowns the same. They're made for that small theatrical platform, and then they fall back to Sky, Netflix, and DVD. But this is a, this is a solid, solid film. It looks beautiful. Um, amazing performances. It's uber-violent. And... Um, <laughs> I hate to say that, but it's one of those things that if it's not real, the audience suss you. Do you know what I mean? They want these yeah. films that are real and, and moving. Well, next time you've got a small part for a bald-headed, thuggish-looking bloke, let me know. Well, it's funny. I ironed out about five Turkish geezers in the house on Saturday, and I thought about you. <laughs> <laughs> I could squib you up and shoot you about six times. If you scream. Well, that's okay. That's all right. I have I have no problem. Luke Luke put me uh, in a couple of movies he made. He never gave me any lines, and right. uh, and and one of them he had to manhandle me through a police station and throw me against the the wall. And the whole time he's shooting, that he's whispering in my, "I'm not hurting you, am I? Are, are you okay?" I'm yeah. saying, "Yeah, fine." Yeah. No, listen. I've heard he's a lovely, lovely geezer, and he's, he's and he's cracking on. And good luck to him. You know what I mean? It's a hard business out there, and I'll take my, my hat off to anybody who can get a career in LA because it's tough. There's nine million actors walking around bumping into each other. It's just uh, well, it's as you, just hard. you you mentioned uh, James Cosmo, who uh, is also, funnily enough, it sounds a bit in this, but he's also a mate of mine, and right. uh, and James, of course, has had loads of success in Game of Thrones. That's right. Yeah. And he is one of the nicest human beings on the face of the earth, without a shadow of a doubt. But to actually act opposite him, he plays my... He's like a father figure to me in this movie. And um, when, the, when the, the, the script was written for me, bespoke by Johnny Malarkey, who's an amazing writer and director. And I read this role and I just I looked at it and all I could hear was James's voice. And I was lucky enough, because we met on this film, Get Lucky, and we became friends. Um, and... We ended up doing this together, and every time I was, you know, when, when we stopped filming and the camera were, was changing film and moving positions, I was looking at him thinking, he was so, there was only one man on the face of the earth could have played Albert Chapman, and it was Jones. Um, he's a brilliant he, actor, he, it's true, to, and he's quite frightening, yeah. his presence, uh, but he's not oh, like God, that in presence. reality at all. He's got presence like no other, I mean, and you know, I'm 6'3", and I'm built, and he's six three, six four, and he's built. He's like, you know, Albert Chapman was a granite jawed powerhouse, and and that is him. Because um, it's it's as I said, you know, when I was saying about Luke, it's it's rare to meet actors who are over the six foot, going into the six one, six two, six threes, who are men who are built. There's very mm. few. 
Um, all the guys I work with are like large midgets. It's weird. You know. <laughs> right, let's embarrass you now. The film uh, I, I first uh, bumped into you on was uh, the Status Quo movie. <laughs> <laughs> Which Listen, I thought I was a great movie, so I went to got Fiji slammed for, quite a lot. For about eight weeks, and I did a lot of fishing. So that was me, done. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with those guys? Oh, they were lovely. I've got to be honest with you. They were so nice. I was so shocked because you do meet a lot of people who are quite mega famous and they're pricks. Um, they're deluded. They've got massive egos and they believe everything that's read about them. And they put in the, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And it's refreshing when you do meet people who are super famous because I'm always impressed to meet them. No matter who they are, if they're famous and I look up to them and it's even more of a pleasure when they're normal. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I, I sat through the movie and I, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. But yeah. the, the, the two, the main guys, of course, in status quo, there are uh, two of them who are in the movie, uh, yeah. are, are just great. And they play it straight. That Basically, the movie is about status quo doing a concert. They see a murder and then they get chased around. Where, where did you film it? We shot it in Fiji. Yeah. That, yeah, that's right. And then it, yeah. a friend of mine produced that, uh, St uh, Stuart St. Paul. Yeah. Directed it. And he exactly, said it rained yeah, the whole time. Directed it. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing location. Just, just, but what a place to get to. The two worst flights in the history of flying. I mean, 12 hours, off for two hours, back on again for 12 hours. You know, and we, I, I was in the bed, lucky enough. God, I don't know what it was <laughs> like at the other, the other end of the plane. It didn't but, make um, you want a career in music, did it? <clears throat> No, but, you know, that, that film was a lot of fun. And I said, they were nice. They were, you know, they wasn't grand or give it the big one at all. So everybody involved on the film, they made very, very comfortable. The people in Fiji were beautiful. And, you know, obviously they looked at status quo as this big, giant rock band, um, which they are, this iconic group. Um, and, you know, and the film the film looks lovely. And it is what it is, that film. It's just a, a caper, fun like the monkeys, it doesn't take itself serious. It's mm. just, you know, a fun film shot in a beautiful location. It's as simple as that, you know. Craig, I could, I could see you in a yeah. TV series like, I don't know, Silent Witness or, or one of these, or DCI Banks or something like that. Would you like to do that? You know what? I've done six quite big films in the last 18 months. Uh, I've got The Hooligan Factory coming out on 200 screens with Universal in July. The Outsiders out in February. I've finished Breakdown. I go straight on to another movie straight after that. I'm doing what I've always set out to do, and that is working independent movies. If a TV, the only TV I've done was three guest stars in America, which was Sarah Connor, The Unit, and Stargate. I've not done any television in the UK for about 10 years. It's just not happened. It's just been, it's been film lucky enough, and I'm... You know, if the role comes along and I'm lucky enough and they want me, then I'll do it, you know. But um, it's, it's never as, as, as simple as that. Do you know what I mean? What about retirement? What about when you get to the stage where you don't want to be rushing around shooting guns and beating people up? I'll just be that big fat geezer who sits behind the desk with a big lard eating Chinese telling people what to do. <laughs> That's my, I <laughs> That's my I idea of a good retirement. for that time because the back and knees are going already. Craig, thanks very much, Judy. We look forward to the new movie, which comes out, what, next year? Yeah, well, The Outsider's out in February. You'll catch that. That'll be on Sky Box Office and DVD. It's called The Outsider. Um, yeah. Uh, there's Vi Kingdom, there's Bulla Quo, there's The Hooligan Factory. Oh, and I'm doing Rise of the Foot Soldier too. Now, this is, a, this is not your cup of tea. It's a very, very violent, true story, gangster movie one of the most successful British gangster films ever made about the Essex boys. It's the one and only one about them, and we're doing a, a number two in the summer. So look out for that. Craig, good to talk with you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And you, James. Best of luck, mate. You take it easy. Have a good afternoon. And you, mate. Take care. Cheers, James. Good to catch up with the hard man actor Craig Fairbrass, who I know will be listening at the moment, Craig, so uh, I'm available uh, next time you're making a movie. Uh, check out some of his movies, of course. Go to our website, 
jameswhaleradio.co.uk and click on the Love Film banner. You can download a month's free movies. You could probably see all Craig's movies in a month. Uh, just before we go, by the way, thank you very much, and to everybody for tuning in. Don't forget, if you're a radio station and you're not putting us out, but you're listening online somewhere and you'd like to put this program out, get in touch with my producer, Robbo, and he will tell you what to do. 30,000-year-old megavirus is coming back. Did you read this story? I read it when you put it out. It's been frozen deep in layers of Siberian permafrost, and it is coming back to life. And there are others coming back to life. And it just made me think, well, we could be doomed now. It just made me think, what would you like to bring back from the past? Uh, So text me, tweet me, Facebook me, Tell me what you would like to bring back from the past. We'll do some more next week. Arthur Sutherland says, common sense, common decency, common respect. And Kevin Ackerman says, the first man and woman, just to prove that their names weren't Adam and Eve. Get in touch and we'll do some more on the programme next week. But for now, thank you very much indeed for listening. Goodbye from Rob. Bye-bye. He puts that on, you know. He's sitting there. James. Looking as miserable as sin. What? Wouldn't the obvious thing to be bring back the cold so all these viruses freeze again? That's a good idea. I'll leave you guys with that. Tell me what you think we should bring back from the past. We'll do some more next week. Bye-bye. James Well, the voice of reason on the James Well radio show. You're listening to the James Well radio show. For more information, visit www.jameswhaleradio.co.uk. Why not check us out on facebook.com slash jameswhaleradioshow or follow James on Twitter at the James Whale. James Whale, the voice of reason.